Now, by the late 19th century, by the 1890s, Turner's work, the slavers had come, as I said, in 1872 and had gone off to Boston in 1876, remained in that city, but American museums began to take notice, the few that there were, of, of Turner's work. In 1899, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston bought the slavers for $65,000. The Metropolitan bought the, whales, the whalers on the left there. I don't know the price, I believe in 1895. And Turner began to find his way, even in some of these late fantastic uh, visionary works, find his way into the canon of European painting that was of such appeal to the great millionaire collectors of the late 19th and early 20th century. And indeed, from the beginning of the 20th century to the stock market crash of 1929, more than 20 major Turner oil paintings came to this country, bought by people like Vanderbilt, Morgan, Frick, Mellon, and others. For instance, the wonderful pictures in the exhibition, which happened to be by, uh, bought, purchased by Andrew Mellon and from the National Gallery, Kielman heaving in coals by moonlight on the left, or approach to Venice, again, one of Ruskin's favorites on the right. Turner became, through this aggressive American collecting, a kind of staple of any collection that wanted to show a proper history of European painting up through uh, the mid-19th century. Now, with the stock market crash, and with the relative decline in available work by Turner's um, in the 1940s and 50s, although a few did become available for sale. Some went back from this country to England. A few others crossed from England uh, to here. The chance to create a large body of Turner's work um, in this country uh, obviously never arose. But more importantly, something very essential to the popular public understanding of Turner's art occurred, and we've heard that alluded to in uh, Professor Sharma's talk earlier. And that was the exhibition that Lawrence Gowing organized for MoMA in 1966. I don't need to, to rehearse what, what you've already heard about that, but I do need to, to stress that works like these in the exhibition, Sunrise with Sea Monsters, or an oil, or a small um, uh, watercolor on the right, Lurid Sunset, these were works that were, would never have been deemed by Turner fully finished. They were left in his studio at the time of his death. Many of them were small color studies, like the watercolor on the right. The oil paintings had been basically hidden away in storage in the National Gallery um, for much of the 20th century, deemed unfit for display. With the, the bulk of, of Turner's bequest passing ultimately to the Tate, a group of these works, almost entirely unfinished works, were assembled for the MoMA exhibition, framed in simple strip frames, some of which uh, they still are in, and hung on the august walls of MoMA as if they were precursors of what had occurred in America from the uh, 1940s and 1950s on, and that was the great rise of abstract painting epitomized by the so-called abstract expressionists. That was a case of historically looking back to a moment in the, the recent uh, artistic um, uh, story and finding an aesthetic parallel in a much earlier artist. And indeed, some of those artists, Barnett Newman, Robert Motherwell, Clifford Still, all talked about Turner, independently of having seen the, the MoMA show, um, but came, came relatively far into their careers, uh, and talked about their admiration for him. Just as an example, Clifford Still said, Turner painted the sea but to me the prairie was just as grand. Others said, Motherwell said, that the game was not about what things look like. The game is organizing as accurately and with deep discrimination as one can, states of feeling, states of, of, of light, questions of color, of weight, et cetera, et cetera, lyricism, somberness. This is especially visible in the artists of a wide range, such as J.M.W. Turner. And indeed, this notion of kind of revisiting Turner's late works, unfinished, unexhibited, as wild as his, his late works did become, and you need only look at something like the steamer in a snowstorm near the end of the exhibition, um, these uh, do not represent a full uh, and proper view of his public uh, persona in, during his lifetime. Um, with that sort of reevaluating of his work, people began to see 
fascinating parallels. And the most obvious one seemed to suggest Mark Rothko, watercolorist, painter of extraordinary um, saturated canvases, such as uh, Untitled 1949, on the left. And when compared with a work like a late Turner uh, watercolor study, such as The Lurid Sunset, there do seem to be parallels. Now, these are not parallels of influence, obviously. In fact, Rothko, when he got to visit the Turner exhibition, it had already gone for a moment, it was over at the Tate in London. Um, he said he actually had never seen any of these works before, uh, and he put, reportedly quipped, that chap Turner learned a lot from me. Um, <laughs> sort of conveniently, in a, in a, in a, in a uh, pithy uh, bon mot, suggesting that this was all just a kind of historical um, uh, reassessing and not anything about influences, et cetera. But that said, the 1966 exhibition certainly broadened the notion of who Turner was in extraordinary ways, so much so that in organizing this exhibition, uh, my colleagues and I felt that, that we couldn't just leave out these works. And indeed, we end the exhibition with uh, a, a small display of works such as The Sunrise with Sea Monsters, Norham Castle, Europa, and the Bull. And this part of Turner's work, regardless of what it was for his public um, persona in his own lifetime, has equally become a part of his fascination and appeal with the notion of Turner, the great historical artist, the great artist of, 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 of theme and content. And indeed, many artists today admire Turner uh, amongst uh, uh, perhaps uh, all others as an extraordinary um, figure to look back on. I've, I've talked to painting, painters of all stripes who, um, who find his work extraordinarily influential and, and inspiring. And I'd like to conclude just with one example of that, and that's Sean Scully whose works may seem to look nothing at all like Turner's, and in fact, they don't. And that's not the point. The point is that his beautiful displays of color, of softly modulated um, forms of, of color and light, have a kind of romanticism, a kind of, of, of sense of, of, of the emotional in abstract art that seems like a response to the world in its way, to the possibilities of art, and yes, to, to an artist like Turner himself, that suggests a real sympathy on the part of Scully and a real understanding. Scully has observed, one of the reasons that Turner has such powerful appeal for us now is that he, more than any other artist of his period, let go of the details of life. His work is absolutely nonlinear, which is symptomatic of the kind of paintings of, that we are involved in in our age today. Now, as I've tried in this, this, I think, probably all too, too brief attempt to suggest who Turner was, both from his own days living, working, and through to today, for America, for American patrons, collectors, artists, admirers of art, has changed and evolved in many, many ways. And I'll leave you then just with another thing that Sean Scully said. The only thing in the end you can really do with a Turner is to submit to its beauty. Thank you. <laughs>